may say perhaps a few words about myself. Since I have been writing detective stories for many years and have many novels to my credit, I may lay claim at least to being an industrious craftsman. <laughs> A more aristocratic title was given to me by an American paper, which dubbed me the Duchess of Death. I have enjoyed writing detective stories. It's the kind of writing that does not permit loose or slipshod thinking. It all has to dovetail to fit in as part of a carefully constructed whole. But I ask what kind of people enjoy detective stories and why? Invariably, I think the busy people, the workers of the world, highly placed men in the scientific world, even if they read nothing else, seem to have time for a detective story. Perhaps because a detective story is complete relaxation, an escape from the realism of everyday life. It has, too, the tonic value of a puzzle. It sharpens your wits, makes you mentally alert. To follow a detective story closely, you need concentration to spot the criminal needs acumen and good reasoning powers. It has also a sporting interest and is much less expensive than betting on horses or gambling at cards. Agatha Christie, the world's best-selling author of all time. Best known for her detective novels, short stories, plays, and her detective sleuths. Miss Marple? and Hercule Poirot. Hercule Poirot first appeared in chapter two of Agatha Christie's first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, published in 1920. The first description of Poirot was by the character <clears throat> Captain Arthur Hastings. Poirot's friend and sometimes assistant. <laughs> he was not more than five feet four inches, but he carried himself with great dignity. His head was exactly the shape of an egg, and he always perched it a little to one side. His <laughs> mustache was very stiff and military. The neatness of his attire was almost incredible. I believe a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound. <laughs> and yet, this quaint, dandified little man, who I was sorry to see now limped badly, had been, in his time, one of the most celebrated members of the Belgian police. Um. In the later books, the limp is not mentioned. Poirot has dark hair and green eyes that are often described as shining like a cat's when he is struck by a clever idea. The world-famous detective takes great pride in his appearance. From his immaculately groomed mustache to his patent leather shoes. Tidy. 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 He insists on precision and neatness. <laughs> See you not as the tallest books go on the top shelf, the next tallest on the row beneath, and so on. Thus, we have order and method. Poirot is extremely punctual and always carries a turnip pocket watch. Hmm. Poirot is also very particular about his beverages. His preferred hot drink is cocoa, though he is known to take herbal tisanes oh. for his health. He does not care for beer no, no. or liquor. <laughs> no. But he does like good wine. Mm. And creme de menthe. Oh, yes. And his favorite aperitif. A non-alcoholic black currant syrup. Mm. And so, friends, we offer you a mystery featuring the famous detective. <coughs> The world famous detective. Mm. Hercule Poirot. The, the adventure of the, the Western, Western Star. Star. I say, uh, <clears throat> ah! 
That's queer. <laughs> what is mon ami? Deduce, Poirot, from the following facts. Here is a young woman richly dressed, fashionable hat, magnificent furs. She is walking along the street looking up at the houses very slowly. Unknown to her, she is being shadowed by three men and a middle-aged woman. What drama is this being played? Is the young girl a crook and are the shadowers detectives preparing to arrest her or are they the scoundrels and are they plotting to uh, attack an innocent victim? Well, what does the great detective say? The great detective chooses, as always, the simplest course. He rises to see for himself. <laughs> oh, my dear Hastings, as usual, your facts are tinged with your incurable romanticism. That is none other than Mary Marvel, the American film star. She is being followed by a bevy of admirers. Ha! <laughs> So all is explained, but you get no marks for that poor row. It was a mere matter of recognition. And how many times have you seen Mary Marvel on the screen, mon cher? Half a dozen, perhaps. <laughs> and I, but once. And yet I recognize her, and you do not. Well, she looks so different. Sacre, do you expect her to promenade on the streets of London in a cowboy hat? Or perhaps an auburn wig, like oh. an Irish Colleen. Always with you, it is the non-essentials. Well, <laughs> well, console yourself, mon ami. Not all can be as Hercule Perrault. <laughs> I know it well. You certainly do have the highest opinion of yourself of anyone I have ever known. Well, what will you? When one is unique, one knows it. <laughs> and, um, and others share that opinion, even if I am not mistaken, Miss Mary Marvel. What? She is coming here without doubt. Well, how do you make that out? Very simply, mon ami. The street, it is not aristocratic. There is no fashionable doctor, no fashionable dentist. There is, however, a fashionable detective. We, oui, my friend, they say, you have lost your gold pencil case. <laughs> you must go see the little Belgian. He is too marvelous. Everyone goes. And they arrive in flocks with the problems of the most foolish. <laughs> what did I tell you? That is Mary Marvell. Don't be ridiculous, Poirot. Why would an American... Oh, Miss Mary Marvell, here to see you, Monsieur Poirot. Oh. Show her in, please, Miss Lamon. <clears throat> Miss Felicity Lemon, Poirot's secretary, has few human weaknesses. The only two mistakes she is recorded as making are a typing error and a mismailing of an electric bill some years ago. Poirot describes her as... Unbelievably ugly and incredibly efficient. If she mentions something that is worth consideration, it usually is worth consideration. Yes, Monsieur Poirot. <clears throat> she is an expert on nearly everything and has plans to create the perfect filing system. Miss Mary Marvell. My word, what a knockout! Mary Marvell was fair and girlish, with the wide, innocent blue eyes of a child. She was undoubtedly one of the most popular actresses on the screen. She had only recently arrived in England in company of her husband of one year, Gregory Rolfe, also a film actor. This was their first visit to England, and everyone was mad for Mary Marvell. Her wonderful clothes, her jewels, her furs. Ooh, one jewel above all, the magnificent diamond, nicknamed to match its owner, the Western Star. Much. True and untrue had been written about this famous stone, which was rumored to have been insured at the enormous sum of 50,000 pounds. You will perhaps think me very foolish, Monsieur Poirot. But Lord Cranshaw was telling me last night how wonderfully you cleared up the mystery of his nephew's murder, and I felt that I just must have your advice. I dare say it's only a silly hoax. Gregory thinks so, but... It just has me worried to death. 
She paused for a breath. <gasps> uh, proceed, madame. You understand, uh, <laughs> you comprehend I am still in the dark. Uh, it's these letters. <laughs> Cheap paper, the name and address carefully printed. <laughs> Let us see inside. No. Uh, the great diamond, which is the left eye of the temple god, must return whence it came. Hmm. The second one is the same. But the third... You have been warned. You have not obeyed. Now the diamond will be taken from you. At the full of the moon, the two diamonds, which are the left and right eye of the temple god, shall return, so it is written. Uh, the first letter I took as a joke. When the second run came, I began to wonder. When the third one arrived yesterday, I thought... Maybe the matter was more serious than I had imagined. I see these did not arrive by post, these letters. Mm, no, they were delivered by hand by a brooding man with a scar and a hat and a red silk scarf. A brooding man with a scar and a hat and a red silk scarf? Yes, and I'm worried. Why? Well, because Gregory bought the stone three years ago from a curio shop in San Francisco. <laughs> it was Greg's wedding present to me. I see. You believe that the diamond referred to be... The Western Star. That's so. Well, Gregory seems to think there was some sort of story attached to the stone. Um, but the shopkeeper wasn't giving out any details. Gregory said he seemed just scared to death and in mortal hurry to get rid of the thing. He said he only sold it for one-tenth of its value. This story has an almost unbelievable romanticism. And yet, who knows? I pray you, Hastings, and me my almanac. Oh, yes. <clears throat> the little one. Oh, yeah. Mm. For your... Mm. When is the date of the full moon? Hmm? Friday next. That is in three days' time. Eh bien, madame, you asked me for my advice... I give it to you. This belle histoire may be a hoax, but it may not. Therefore, I consult you to leave the diamond in my keeping until after Friday next. Then we can take what steps we please. I'm afraid that's impossible. You have this stone with you, no? The lovely lady hesitated, then slipped her hand into her purse, or did she slip her hand into the bosom of her gown? <clears throat> Withdrawing an object. She opened her hand. In the palm, a stone of fire lay and winked at us solemnly. A potent. You permit, madame? Mm -hmm. A marvelous stone without a flaw. <laughs> And you carry it about with you, madame. Oh, no, I'm really very careful. As a rule, I leave it locked in my jewel case, and, and I leave it at the hotel safety deposit. We're saying the magnificent, you know. <laughs> uh, I just brought it to show you. <laughs> and you will leave it with me? You will take the advice of Papa Poirot? Well, see, it's like this, Monsieur Poirot. On Friday, we're going down to Yardley Chase to spend a few days with Lord and Lady Yardley. Ah. Mm. A few years ago, Lord and Lady Yardley had visited the state. Rumor has it that his lordship rather ran the pace out there with the assistance of some lady friends, but surely there was something else, some bit of gossip coupling Lady Yardley's name with that of a movie star in California. Why, it came to me in a flash. Of course, it was none other than Gregory Rolfe. 
I'll let you in on a little secret, Monsieur Poirot. We got a deal going on with Lord Yardley. There's a chance of us actually filming a play down in his ancestral pile. <laughs> what at Yardley Chase? It's one of the showplaces of England. Mm, yeah, I guess it's the old feudal stuff, all right. But he wants a pretty stiff price, and I'm not sure if the deal's going to go through yet. But Gregory and I always like to mix business with pleasure. <laughs> but, uh... <clears throat> I demand pardon if I am dense, madame, but surely it is possible to visit Yardley Chase without taking the diamond with you. <laughs> I want to wear it down there. Surely there are many famous stones in the Yardley collection, a large diamond amongst them? Yes. Mm. Mm. Ah, I see. So you undoubtedly are well acquainted with uh, Lady Yardley, or perhaps your husband is? <clears throat> Yes, Gregory knew her when she was out west three years ago. Oh, tell me, uh, do either of you read the Society Gossip column? I have never Actually, read it. I do give it right. <clears throat> well, I only ask because this week's column is about uh, uh, oh, famous stones, and it's really very interesting. <clears throat> Amongst other famous stones may be considered the Star of the East. Diamond, Diamond in the in possession, possession of the of Yardley, Yardley family. family. An ancestor of the present Lord Yardley brought the stone back with him from a travel in the East. A romantic story is said to be attached to it. It is said that this stone was once the right eye of the Temple of God, and that another jewel, similar in size and form, formed the left eye. And it, the story goes that this stone, too, would in course of time be stilated. Stolen. And one eye shall go west, the other east, till they shall meet once more. Then, in triumph, shall they return to the temple of God. It is a curious coincidence that there is, at this present time, a stone closely corresponding in description to this one, named the Star of the West. Or the Western Star. It is the possession of celebrated film actress Miss Mary Marvell. A comparison of the, of the two, two stones would be interesting. interesting. Hmm. Epotone. Without doubt, the romance of the first water. And you are not afraid, madame. You do not have any uh, superstitious terrors. <laughs> you do not fear to introduce these twin gemstones to each other. Hmm? Uh, I mean, a mobster or a spirit might appear and whisk them away. <laughs> There's no way that Lady Yardley's diamond is as good a stone as mine. Anyway, I'm going to see. What more Poirot may have said, I do not know. For at that moment, the door flew open and in strode a splendid-looking young man. From his crisply curling black head to his patent leather boots, he was a star fit for romance, standing at over six feet tall. Standing at over six feet tall, it was Mary's husband, the American film actor Gregory B. Rolfe. I said I'd call around for you, Mary, and here I am. Mm -hmm. well, what does Monsieur Poirot say about our little problem? One big hoax, same as I do. Hoax or no hoax, Monsieur Rolfe, I have advised your wife not to take the stone with her to Yardley Chase on Friday. I'm with you there, sir. Said so to Mary myself, but there... Uh... She can't bear the thought of another woman outshining her in the jewelry department. <laughs> <laughs> what nonsense, Gregory. I have given my advice, madame. That is all I can do. Say pen. And Poirot bowed them to the door.
Oh la la, histoire de femme. Oh, the husband, he hit the nail on the head, but he was not tactful, assuredly not. Uh, look here, Poirot, old chap, I seem to recall there were some rumors a few years back regarding Lady Yardley and Gregory Rolfe. You see, the Yardleys have been on holiday in the Americas. Ah, yes, it is as I thought. All the same, there is something curious underneath all this. With your permission, mon ami, I will take the air. Uh, wait for me here. Uh, uh, I beg of you. I will return shortly. <clears throat> oh, Captain Hastings! Captain Hastings! Captain Hastings, wake up! It's another lady here to see Monsieur Poirot. Oh! I've told him that she's out. Show her in here, Miss Lemon. Perhaps there's something I can do for her. My heart leapt as I recognized her. Lady Yardley's portrait had featured too often in society pages for her to remain unknown. Lady Yardley, my apologies. My friend Poirot is out, but I know for a fact that he shall return very shortly. Thank you. A very different type, this, from Miss Mary Marvell. Tall, dark with flashing eyes and a pale, proud face. And yet, something wistful about the corners of the mouth. I felt the desire to rise to the occasion. <laughs> Why not? In Poirot's presence, I have often felt a difficulty. Well, I do not appear at my best, and yet there can be no doubt that I do possess the deductive sense in a marked degree. <clears throat> Lady Yardley, do sit down. Lady Yardley, I know why you are here today. You have been receiving blackmailing letters about the diamond. Oh dear. <laughs> there was no doubt as to my bolt having shot home. <laughs> you know. How? Through a perfectly logical process. If Miss Marvell has had warning Miss letters... Miss Marvell, she has been here? She has just left. As I was saying, if Miss Marvell, as owner of one of the twin diamonds, has been receiving mysterious warning letters, then you, as the holder of the other diamond, must necessarily have done the same. You see how simple it is? <clears throat> I am right, then, that you have been receiving these strange communications also. For a moment she hesitated as though unsure whether to trust me or not. I do not know if I should trust you or not. But then she gave a little smile. But yes, that is so. Were yours too delivered by hand by a brooding man with a scar and a hat and a red silk scarf? No, they were delivered by post. But tell me, has Miss Marvell undergone the same experience then? I recounted to her the events of the morning. She listened attentively. Mm, it all fits. My letters are the duplicates of hers. Mm. Oh, what does it all mean? Could some mobster really be trying to steal the diamonds? It seems too incredible. Well, that is what we must find out. You have the letters with you. We might be able to learn something from the postmarks. No, at the, at the time I took it as some silly joke, you understand, so, unfortunately, I destroyed the letters. She destroyed the letters? <laughs> I enjoyed telling Poirot the account of the events that occurred during his absence. He <laughs> cross-questioned me rather sharply about the details, but I could see between the lines that he was not best pleased to have been absent. 
I also fancied that the dear old fellow was just the least inclined to be jealous. He consistently belittles my abilities, and I think he was chagrined at finding no loophole for criticism this time around. I was secretly quite pleased with myself, though I did my best to conceal it for fear of irritating my quaint little friend. Très <laughs> bien. The plot develops. Mm. And tomorrow morning, we meet Lord Yardley. What? We oui, I telegraphed him to come here. But I thought you had washed your hands of the case. Mm. I am not acting for Mary Marvell. No, she will not take my advice. What I do now is for myself, my own pleasure. The pleasure of Hercule Poirot. Decidedly, I must stick my finger in this delicious, mysterious pie. <clears throat> and you calmly wire Lord Yardley to dash up town just to suit your convenience? He won't be pleased. Au contraire, my friend. If we preserve for him his family diamond, he ought to be very grateful. You really do believe there is a chance of it being stolen? Right? Almost a certainty. Everything points that way. But how would... No, so no, no, not now. Let us not confuse the mind. For now, it is lunch time. <laughs> <laughs> Yardley, Monsieur Poirot. Lord Yardley turned out to be a cheery, loud-voiced sportsman with a rather ruddy face, but with a good-natured bonhomie about him that was distinctly attractive and made up for any lack of mentality. <laughs> Extraordinary business, this, Monsieur Poirot. I can't make it all day of it. Seems my wife's been getting these odd kinds of letters, and that this Miss Marvell's had them too. Oh, 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 what does it all mean? First, my lord, I will ask, are the reports in the newspapers concerning the diamond substantially correct? Oh, damn nonsense. Mm. There's never been a romantic story attached to the diamond. Well, it, it came from India originally, well, I believe. But I've never heard of all this temple god stuff. Mm. Well, still, the stone is known as the Star of the East. What if it is? <laughs> well, my lord, I would ask you this. Would you please place yourself in my hands? If you do so unreservedly, then I have great hopes of averting a catastrophe. So you believe that there's something to these wild cat tales? Will you do as I ask? <laughs> well, of course I bien, will. Bien, but bien, I bien. First, let me ask you a few questions. Okay. Permit me so. Uh, this uh, affair at Yardley Chase, uh, is it, as you say, a, a done deal between you and Monsieur Rolf? Uh, he told you about that, did he? Well, no. It's nothing settled. Might as well get the thing straight. Well, I've made rather an ass of myself, Monsieur Poirot, in many ways. Uh, and I'm Head over ears in debt, but I want to pull up. I'm fond of the kids, and I want to straighten things up and live on in the old place. Oh, well, Gregory Rolfe is offering me big money, enough to set me back on my feet again. I don't want to do it. The thought of that crowd just play acting the chase. I hate to do it, but I have to. Well, that is a mess. Ah, I see you have another string on your bow. Permit me a guess. <clears throat> is it to sell the Star of the East? 
Well, that's it. <laughs> well, it's been in my family for generations, but it's not entailed. <laughs> and still, it's not the easiest thing in the world to find a purchaser for. Mm. <laughs> Holzberg's Jewelers is actually looking for a likely customer, but they have to find one soon or, or it's a washout. Mm. <laughs> one more question, Permite. <laughs> Lady Yardley, which plan does she approve? <laughs> she bitterly opposes my selling the diamond. <laughs> ah! She's all for this film stunt. Yeah, I comprehend. You must return at once to Yardley Chase, but say not a word to anyone, to anyone, mind you. Expect us there this evening. We will be there shortly after five. Half past five when we arrived. Yardley Chase was a massive, dignified home. We were welcomed in and ushered to follow the dignified butler. Yes, 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 yes. To the old panelled hall with its fire of blazing logs. Oh, a pretty picture met our eyes. Lady Yardley calling after her children. Tommy! Tuppence! I do hope you'll share! Please listen to Nanny! <laughs> the perfect picture of motherhood. <laughs> Captain Hastings and uh, Miss York were room. <laughs> Captain Hastings, what a surprise. All our excuses, madame. Um, I am... I know who you are, Monsieur Poirot. Welcome to Yardley Chase. I am so glad I took the advice of Mary Cavendish and visited your office. Tommy! I told you not to chase your sister! I adore them. And they you, madame, no doubt, with reason. You are so kind to say so. <laughs> uh, pardon the interruption, madame, but uh, we uh, investigate still this affair of Mary Marvell's. Uh, she comes to you on Friday, does she not? Hmm? Why, yes. The... <sighs> Perhaps I may take a little tour of the house to uh, make sure all is secure. Hmm? Secure? Hmm. Of course. Yeah. Here's my husband now, uh, darling. <clears throat> Captain Hastings and Monsieur Poirot are here to uh, discuss the diamond and uh, secure the grounds. Oh, well. Hello, Monsieur Poirot, Captain Hastings. I am... So surprised that you are here. <laughs> oh, well, you are most certainly welcome. Thank you. Also, I wonder if I might ask Lady Yardley if she recalls anything about the postmarks on the letters she received. I'm afraid I don't. I, I know it's quite stupid of me. I never dreamed they'd be important. Oh, well, you'll stay the night. Oh, we couldn't have imagined that they'll inconvenience you. Oh, <laughs> oh no, we, we have left our bags at the inn. Oh, that's all right. We'll send someone down for them. No, no, oh, no, 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 no <laughs> trouble at all, I assure no, you. <laughs> oh, and uh, Miss Your Poirot, you want to know? Hmm. Uh, a telegram just came in. It's from Hofsburg Jewel. It's just arrived. He says he's found a spire 
for the stone an american sailing for the states tomorrow he's sending down a diamond expert to vet the stone tonight after dinner oh, by jove if this goes through oh I george don't... i wish you wouldn't sell it it's been in the family for so long <laughs> I must go dress for dinner. I suppose I shall wear for you all the Eastern Star. It's the most hideous necklace in all of England. George has always promised to get the stones reset for me, but uh, it's never been done. <laughs> Madame, we await the exhibit with breath that is held. <laughs> Half an hour later, we three were assembled in the great drawing room, awaiting the lady. It was already a few minutes past the dinner hour. Suddenly, Lady Yardley appeared, framed in the doorway, a radiant figure in red. Round her neck lay a rivulet of fire. She stood with one hand, just touching the necklace. Behold the sacrifice. <laughs> Oh, wait while I turn on the big light and you shall feast your eyes on the ugliest necklace in all of England. The switches were just outside the door. As she stretched her hand out to them, the incredible thing happened. Suddenly, without warning, every light in the house was extinguished. The door banged. Then a long-drawn, piercing woman's scream. <coughs> Oh my god, the blood voice! What happened? We blindly rushed to the door, cannoning into each other in the dark. I say! Oh. <gasps> Lady Yardley lay senseless on the marble floor, a crimson mark on her white throat where the necklace had been wrenched from her neck. <gasps> it was! The brooding man with the scar and the hat and the red silk scarf. <laughs> the side door! <laughs> Aha! Look here on the threshold. It's the necklace. Uh, the thief must have dropped it in his panic. Look, Poirot. No, Hastings. It is not. Look, the Eastern Star. It is gone. That <gasps> settles it. These were no ordinary thieves. That one stone was all they wanted. But how'd the fellow get in? Through the side door. Oh, that's impossible. That door's always locked. Well, it isn't locked now. And look! Ha ha! A piece of red silk. It must be the brooding man with the scar in the hat and the red silk scarf. It's a clue, Poirot. A clue! <laughs> Poro mocked rival detectives for their use of traditional trail of clues. <laughs> it is true, I do not use the uh, professional procedure. <laughs> uh, I am uh, in seeking of the psychology, not the fingerprint or the cigarette ash. <laughs> Poro inquires into the mind of the victim or the murderer. Mm. Poro speaks of the little gray cells and order and method. Irritating to Hastings, and sometimes his readers, is the fact that Poirot will sometimes withhold important details of his plans. Poirot's method focused on getting people to talk. <laughs> Tell Papa Poirot everything. <laughs> he lies freely. Poirot likes to appear less fluent at English than he actually is in order to get people to um, underestimate him. It is true. <laughs> I can speak the exact, the idiomatic English. But to speak the broken English, my friend, is a true asset. It leads people to despise you. Mm, he'll also appear more vain than he actually is. <laughs> I boast. And an Englishman believes that a fellow who thinks too much of himself cannot be worth much. All of these techniques lead Poirot to his principal target, the, the truth. truth. <laughs> For in the end, either through a lie or through truth, people are bound to give themselves away. Oh. 
Growing up, I watched a lot of Agatha Christie murder mysteries. First time that I ever came across Hercule Poirot was seeing David Suchet play the role and came across this fascinating, quaint little man and this amazing character. And from there, I uh, had to learn more and I became obsessed with watching the show. He would watch um, the Poirot mysteries um, the David Suchet version. Just from there, just became really obsessed with mostly, I think, Christie's biggest novels with him, which are, uh, of course, uh, Death on the Nile and Murder on the Orient Express. Murder on the Orient Express. Once you've seen it, or and eventually I read it, um, you don't forget that ending. And it is, I think, a perfect mystery. Don't know the ending, it is just one of the, I think it's one of the most stellar twist endings of all time. I feel like people like mysteries because we as humans have an innate sense of curiosity about us. The putting together of the puzzle, the twists and turns of the plot, big reveals, the whodunits, and all of those things are wonderful and I love all those things, but I'll tell you what I love, I love the characters. Our takes on these characters are very different than most adaptations of Agatha Christie's work. I know that we've done that, with our hearts wide open and with all the love and respect for Christy. That being said, we're absolutely bonkers and ridiculous and we're having a lot of fun with it. So it's been a ball playing him. Uh, the first time I put on the mustache, it was um, kind of otherworldly. Um, really uh, cool and weird and it's been lovely. I, you know, I'm having a lot of fun with him, and we are definitely performing this show tongue firmly planted in cheek. When you're a lot of characters in a show, it takes so much time and energy to make sure each character is unique and individual, but that you can replicate it uh, at any moment's time, because these characters are in and out of scenes um, quite frequently, and you have to be ready to embody that character at a moment's notice. Um, it's a great acting challenge, but it can be exhausting. Yeah. Well, I have Miss Lemon, and I think Poro just uses the best adjective, just unbelievably ugly. We have Lord Yardley, who I would say is loud. Gregory Rolf, American film star, um, who I'd say is a bit arrogant. Love the range of characters I get to play in this show. Uh, Mary Marvell, who is this uh, uh, very like <sighs> uh, archetypal movie star from the 1920s, and then I get to move on to play uh, a femme fatale. I've never really played a femme fatale before, but man, it is is a lot of fun playing Lady Yardley. I stole a lot of stuff from Angelica Houston in. The Addams Family movies from the 90s. And then I briefly get to play Miss Lemon. I like the idea that we would get to play Miss Lemon at some point. Probably the highlight of my career is, is playing the pale faced clerk, which will happen in Act 2, and I can't talk too much about without a spoiler. Uh, it is, it's, it's so much fun. I love this set. Um, this set is uh, super fun. Um, it is it really the mindset of uh, working and reusing materials and trying to be uh, 
environmentally conscious through a reuse of, of, of materials, but also just economically from our own sense of being able to take pieces and um, and find as many different ways you can use them. And this is stuff that's been on this that's on that's on this set has been in many shows. But what I've loved about this is that it's been six people kind of creating something cool that we all have been passionate about, that we all love, that um, has been collaborative and frustrating and wonderful at the same time. We want theater to be accessible to everyone. And so now with a official ticket price of zero or pay what you will, um, I'm hoping that people that maybe haven't tapped into theater can, can tap into this. I hope that people will consider joining the Inner Circle. We wish that we could open our doors. So this is the way that we can connect. And the best way to support us and the best way to connect with us. The Inner Circle is our monthly subscription service and the best way people can support us right now. Well, the Inner Circle is great. It's a, a way to uh, have access to everything uh, that we're doing here at Open Stage. For as little as $10 a month, people not only have access to all the productions we're doing here at Open Stage, we're doing 15 shows this season. And so you can access all of those, uh, plus extra content that we're releasing only to our Inner Circle members. And there's lots of behind the scenes type of stuff that our Inner Circle members are gonna, are gonna get to enjoy that uh, is a lot of fun. Your $10 a month is going to ensure that somebody else who can't afford $10 a month is going to be able to see these shows. Amongst Poirot's most significant personal attributes is his sensitive stomach. He suffers from seasickness and air sickness. Poirot is disgusted by disorder. He once said, It is truly unsupportable that every hen should lay an egg of a different size. What symmetry can there be at the breakfast table? He is known to have refused to eat an irregularly shaped loaf of bread. The little Belgian was not loved by everyone. In fact, Agatha Christie was not a big fan of her creation, calling him a detestable, bombastic, tiresome, egocentric little creep. Plastic quarrel, what a mess. Yes, these eggs are a concern. There is one centimeter difference, perhaps one and a half. Not the eggs, Poirot, the thief, the brooding man with the scar in the hat, the red silk scarf. He made his getaway so easily and so soon before the gentleman from Hofburg's jewelers was to arrive. What terrible luck! I am just glad that Lady Yardley came to and sufficiently recovered to be able to tell her story. <laughs> I was just going to turn on the big light when a man sprang on me from behind. He tore my necklace from my neck so hard that I fell headlong to the floor. As I fell, I saw him escape through the side door. The brooding man! <sighs> With the scar and the hat and the red silk scarf. Things haven't gone very well, have they? I mean, you tell Lord Yardley to place himself in your hands, and then the diamond vanishes from underneath your very nose. Truly, it is not one of my most striking triumphs. I am glad we made a graceful exit, leaving behind us a note of apology. <sighs> I am still sorry about the dinner. So without most excellent dinner, prepared by the chef of Lord Yardley. What dinner?! Oh, mon Dieu, it is that in this country you treat the affairs gastronomique with a 
with a criminal indifference. I am still thinking of the other diamond, Miss Marvell's. Uh, bien, what of it? As I said last night, they've got the one, now they'll go for the other. Oh, my friend, your brain marches to a marvel, my friend. <laughs> uh, figure for a moment that I had not thought of that. Mm. But we have plenty of time. The full of the moon, it is not until Friday. Blast the full of the moon theory. We must go at once to the Magnificent and relate to Miss Marvell last evening's occurrences. It's already in the morning papers. The Rolfs will know quite as much as we can tell them. <sighs> Poirot seemed strangely disinclined to make our next move. I began to suspect that having made a mistake to start with, he was now singularly loath to proceed with the case. But events proved my forebodings to be justified. At two o'clock, the telephone rang. Poirot answered it. Hello? Bien. 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 We will be there. Listen to this, my friend. The diamond that Miss Marvell's, it has been stolen. What? Well, what of the full moon now? Oh, when did this happen? This morning, I understand. If you had only listened to me, you see now that I was right. Uh, it certainly appears so, mon ami. Appearances can be deceptive, but it certainly appears so. No, Sapristi, is Hercule Poirot mistaken? Never. Ah, let us be calm. Let us reflect. Let us reason. Let us effect. Employ the little gray says. He clasped his fingers together in his most foreign manner. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Oh, I have been an imbecile. We must go now to the Hotel Magnificent. We hurried in a taxi to the Magnificent. That full of the moon idea was clever. The whole idea of it was to keep us concentrating on the next Friday, thereby keeping us off our guard beforehand. It is a pity you didn't notice that. Uh, one cannot think of everything. Well, cheer up. Better luck next time. At the Magnificent, we were ushered at once into the manager's office. Gregory Rolfe was there. A pale-faced hotel clerk sat opposite. Uh, it's almost unbelievable. How the guy had the nerve, I can't think. In a very few minutes, we uh, suffice to give us all of the information. Uh, at 11.15, Rolf <laughs> left the hotel. At 11.30, another man who was basically the spitting image of Rolf <laughs> stepped into the hotel and up to the front desk clerk. Hello? And demanded the jewel case be brought out from safe deposit. Front desk clerk. I demand the jewel case from the safe deposit. The man duly signed the receipt, carelessly remarking as he did so. Uh, my John Hancock looks a bit odd. I hurt my hand in the taxi on the way over here. I, I better be careful or I'll scar my hand like I've scarred my face. <laughs> Well, don't call the police on me anyway. So, 
It was the brooding man with the scar and the hat and the red silk scarf. Does it look like I have a scar on my face? Does that look like my signature? Does it look like I'd wear a red scarf? Oh, you need to get your eyes checked, man. Bold customer thought the signature might be noticed and took the bull by the horns to disarm suspicion. He must have watched me leave the hotel and then nipped it while I was away. But what about the jewel case? Oh, they found it in the hotel corridor. Only one thing was missing. The Western Star. It was all so bizarre, so unreal. Poirot hopped to his feet. I am afraid that I have not been of much use. Uh, perhaps it would be permitted for me to speak to Madame? No. She's resting. She's had quite a shock. Mm, I comprehend. Uh, perhaps I can have a word alone with you. Uh, perhaps in the hall, Monsieur? Oh, certainly. In about five minutes, uh, Poirot returned. Well, my friend, we must be off. I have to go to the post office. I need to send a telegram. <clears throat> to who? <clears throat> uh, Lord Yardley. I... Ah, uh, uh, come, come, my friend. I know how you feel about this whole miserable business. Uh, you... I have not distinguished myself. I... You, in my place, might have distinguished yourself. Bien. Let us forget about it. The post office can wait. We shall have a little lunch. It was four o'clock when we entered Poirot's room. A figure stood from the chair near the doorway. It was Lord Yardley. He looked haggard and distraught. I got your wire and came up at once. Now see here, I've been to Hofsburg Jewelers and they know nothing about this man of theirs last night or the wire either. Many what excuses, sir, uh, many excuses. I sent that telegram from Hofburg's and hired the gentleman in question. Well, you? But why? What? The gentleman spluttered impotently. Oh, but you? But, 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 but why? I had a little idea to bring things to a head. And my little ruse worked perfectly. Therefore, I am pleasured to present to you this. With a dramatic gesture, he withdrew a glittering object. It was a great diamond. The Star of the East. But, 
But I don't understand. No? <laughs> it makes no matter. Believe me, it was necessary for the diamond to be stolen. I promised you that it should be preserved to you, and I have kept my word. You must permit me to keep my little secret. Now please, convey to your lovely wife, uh, Lady Yardley, that I am so pleased to be able to restore to her her lovely diamond. You have a lovely day, sir. Goodbye. Poirot, am I quite demented? No. But as usual, <laughs> Ace thinks you are in a mental fog. How did you get the diamond? From Monsieur Rolf. Rolf? <laughs> May we? The warning letters, the brooding man with the scar on the hat and the red silk scarf, the article in Society Gossip, all of it sprang from the ingenious brain of Gregory B. Ralph. Ha-ha! <laughs> the two diamonds supposed to be so miraculously alike? Bah! They do not exist. There is but one diamond. Originally in the Yardley's collection, for the last three years, it has been in possession of Monsieur Ralph. Ha-ha! <laughs> This morning he stole it from his wife's jewelry case in the hotel safe deposit box. But that was the brooding man with the scar and the hat and the red silk scar. <laughs> no, no. With some help of some grease paint to form the scar on his face and, and the red scarf around his neck and the, the dark hat to complete the costume. <gasps> Rolf! Is the brooding man with the scar in the hat and the red silk scar? Why? I need to see him on the film. He is an artiste cellular. But why should he steal his own diamond? For many reasons. The first of which is that Lady Yardley was very quickly and certainly unable to keep her silence. Lady Yardley? Yes. Lady Yardley. Oh, uh, here. Yes, Lady Yardley shall very quickly and certainly be unable to keep her silence. You see, Lady Yardley was left very much alone in California. Not alone. Her husband was amusing herself elsewhere. Mm. And, uh, but Rolf, <laughs> Monsieur Rolf, he was handsome. <laughs> he had the air about him of romance. <laughs> he made love to Lady Yardley. <laughs> <laughs> but Rolf, he is gunning. <laughs> he blackmailed Lady Yardley. I am blackmailed. He, I taxed the lady with the truth the other night, and she admitted it. <laughs> I am being blackmailed. I swear I was only being indiscreet. You believe me, don't you? But... Rolf has letters that he will twist, and I'm terrified of a divorce. I do love my children so. I do not wish to lose them. Tommy and Tuppence, do share. Listen to Mummy. So, Lady Yardley, uh, she did everything that Rolf asked. <laughs> Having no money of her own, she was forced to permit Rolf to substitute a fake diamond for the real stone. You see, Hastings, the coincidence of the date of the appearance of the Western Star struck me at once. I see. At least I think I do. Everything was going well for a while, until one day Lord Yardley was planning to pay off his debts with a possible sale of the diamond. The substitution will be discovered. She writes off frantically to Monsieur Rolf, who has recently uh, arrived in England. He comes, lady, promising to arrange a double robbery. A, a double robbery? A double robbery! That is what I said. This way, Monsieur Rolf will uh, quiet the lady who might conceivably tell all to her husband. A scandal would do no good for our blackmailer. In the end, he will have the 50,000 pounds of insurance money. I had forgotten that. And he will still have the diamond. At this point, I stick my finger squarely in the middle of the round pie. Right. <clears throat> <laughs> 
<clears throat> it is then announced that the diamond expert from Offberg's Jewelers will arrive after dinner. And Lady Yardley, as I thought she would, immediately staged a robbery, and she did well, too. Behold the sacrifice. Oh, wait while I turn on the big light, and you shall feast your eyes on the ugliest necklace in all of England. Ah! Oh my God, that's Maud's voice! I say! Oh, ah! Mon Dieu! <gasps> But Hercule Poirot, he sees nothing but fox. What happens in actuality? Oh. Uh, 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 Behold the sacrifice. Oh, wait while I turn on the big light, and you shall feast your eyes on the ugliest necklace in all of England. The lady switches off the light, throws the necklace down the passage, slams the door, and screams. Ah! Oh my God, that's more. I say. Ow. Mon Dieu. <gasps> Side door. Aha! But the lady has already wrenched the fake diamond from the necklace with pliers upstairs. I object. Hmm? We all saw her with the necklace round her neck. I demand pardon, but her end covered the part where the gap would have shown. Oh. <clears throat> Behold the sacrifice. Wait while I turn on the big light, and you shall feast your eyes on the ugliest necklace in all of England. Oh. <laughs> And to, to place the piece of red silk in the doorway beforehand. <laughs> it was child's play. Oh, I thought it was a nice touch. <laughs> when Rolf heard of the robbery, he immediately arranged his own comedy. And very well he played it also. <laughs> <laughs> he left the building at a quarter past eleven and returned at half past, in costume ever the actor extraordinaire. Ha <laughs> oh, ha, quick. I need the jewel case from the safe deposit box. My cock hand jog looks a bit odd, you see. I shut my taxi in my hand on the way here. If I'm not careful, I'll scar my face like I scarred my hand. Well, don't call the police on me anyway. What did you say to Rolf when you took him aside to the hall? <laughs> I told him that Lady Yardley had told her husband all, and that I was um, <clears throat> empowered to secure the diamond, and if it were not returned immediately, that proceedings would be taken. I said. And another few little lies that I sprinkled on top. He was like wax in my hands. It seems a little unfair on Mary Marvell. She has lost her diamond through no fault of her own. Bah. She has a magnificent advertisement. That is all she cares about, that one. Now, Lady Yardley, she is different. Uh, yes, I, I suppose it was Rolf who sent the duplicate letters. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. She came on the advice of Mary Cavendish uh, for my assistance in her dilemma. Then, hearing that Mary Marvell... Mary Marvell... Whom she knew to be her enemy... She has been here? ...had been here earlier in the afternoon, she changed her mind, jumping at the pretext that you, my friend, offered her. You told her of the letters, not she, you. Oh, I don't believe it! See, see, mon ami, it is a pity you study not the psychology. 
<laughs> she said the letters were destroyed. <laughs> oh, la, la. Never does one destroy a mysterious letter. It's all very well, but you've made a perfect fool of me from beginning to end. Oh, <laughs> but you were so enjoying yourself, my oh. friend. I had not the art to, uh, to shatter your illusions. It's no good. I am so sorry, bon ami. I hope you will accept my apology. Oh. Perhaps I can make it up to you and take you to lunch at the club. The great detective deduces that perhaps you are just a little bit hungry. Poirot was right. I was famished. He's always right. Confound him. Oh, my dear Hastings. It is the brain, remember, the little gray cells on which one must rely. One <laughs> must seek the truth within and not without. <laughs> Agatha Christie wrote an essay entitled Why I Got, I got fed, fed Up with, with Poirot, Poirot. <laughs> closing with a warning of sorts. Hercule Poirot has made quite a place for himself in the world and is regarded perhaps with more affection by outsiders than by his own creator. I would give one piece of advice to young detective writers. Be very careful what central character you create. You may have him with you for a very long time.